I've been patient, and now you have to deal with my ultimate fanboying. That's right, today we're going to talk about the Blue Beetle. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Tales Showcase, where our inner monologue never shuts off. I'm your host, the Watcher of New Earth. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, and anything else you might consider yourself, you heard right. After making a brief appearance in one of my first reviews, today we finally get to talk about the Blue Beetle again. Published in 1986, this is the first Blue Beetle series printed by DC Comics, after they bought the rights to the character from Charlton Comics. It's written by the incredibly underappreciated Len Wein, who not only created Swamp Thing, Nightcrawler, and Wolverine, but also returned the X-Men to prominence in the mid-70s, paving the road for the revolutionary Chris Claremont. The art is done by Paris Collins, whose best known work is probably this book and his work on Blue Devil in the 80s. So if you all can't tell, I'm excited to share my favorite superhero with you all today. So let's get this started. This is Blue Beetle, number one. Chicago. They call it the Windy City. For the three of you that were dying to learn Chicago's nickname. Our story opens in Chicago as a fire rages. The firefighters seem to be beside themselves. However, the Blue Beetle arrives overhead. The people of a simpler time and place knew him only as Blue Beetle. The people of a more complicated time and place knew him as the Green Hornet. Remember the name. After today, you'll never forget it. Huh, that's how I start all my conversations about the Blue Beetle. Beetle lands on the roof and sees a figure in the fire. Thinking it's a trapped firefighter, he reaches for him. This wins him a punch in the face. That's Chicago for you. Actually, it turns out to be the person that started the fire. A villain named Firefist. A fight breaks out between them. Beetle goes for the mask. No! Not my face! Aw, somebody's shy. Firefist whacks Beetle away and increases the flames to prevent Beetle from following him. He also swears that if he weren't in a rush, he'd burn Beetle alive. Yeah, God forbid you lose those two seconds setting him on fire. Firefist escapes, but Beetle hears someone still trapped inside. Using the bug, his flying aircraft, he hoists himself up and drops back suddenly, making a large hole in the roof. He quickly finds the fireman and prepares to ascend. However, his escape is now covered in flames and the building starts to come down. They decide to hold on and the building collapses around them, leaving them unscathed. Way to inspire the trailer scene in Jurassic Park 2. With his job done, Beetle sets off. He then hovers over the city and goes underwater where he emerges in his underground secret lair. He then takes off his Blue Beetle costume and becomes Ted Cord, scientist, entrepreneur, and chairman of Cord Inc. Bear in mind that he just narrated all of this in his own head. Kinda makes you wonder if he does this every time he enters his lair. We then go into a flashback to learn the Beetle's origin. It all starts with Ted beginning to suspect his uncle, Jarvis, because of a film reel he found outlining weapon plans. He decides to show this to his most trusted friend, his old archaeology professor, Dan Garrett. You can tell that Ted was extremely popular. They go to Pago Island to investigate, but are immediately captured by robots. It turns out Ted's uncle was the man responsible. When all seems lost, Dan Garrett transforms into the original Blue Beetle. In a massive fight, both Jarvis and Dan perish. Before he dies, Dan makes Ted promise to continue on as the Blue Beetle. And yet, didn't give him the instructions on how to work the mystical scarab that grants all the superpowers. Hmm. Dan seems like a stand-up guy, doesn't he? With his reminiscing over, he goes to work at his company. His secretary awaits him with numerous messages, which he answers nonchalantly as she scrambles to keep up. There's probably a Janine Melnitz joke here, but we're gonna move right along. He heads over to his science department as his top two scientists, Jeremiah Duncan and Melody Case, are hard at work. Or, at least, they're supposed to be. Instead, they were working on a method for instant filet mignon. Ted reprimands them for not working on what he hired them for, and instead working on these get-rich-quick schemes. Big talk from a guy that in a few years would be known for his get-rich-quick schemes. Ted and Melody then begin to flirt as they appear to be in a relationship and- OH MY GOD HER EYES! Jeez, even anime characters are telling you to dial it down. Ted tells them to inspect some rubble he collected from the fire, so he has a better way of searching for Fire Fist. Meanwhile, on Pago Island, a man arrives, searching for what Dan Garrett searched for. He says that when he finds it, the whole world will honor Conrad Carapax. You might want to change the name. Conrad Carapax doesn't exactly read as person to be honored. My apologies to all Conrad Carapaxes out there. 
Meanwhile, Ted has been called to start lads of the Chicago division by Murray Takamoto, the head of that division and Ted's former roommate. Apparently, Takamoto is working on a project with Promethium to create armor plating. However, he has not had much success and wants Ted's help. Ted agrees and Takamoto says he'll send the Promethium over the next day. Behind them, however, a janitor hears and thinks to himself that he can't allow that to happen or it would ruin his plans. Apparently, the Promethium had agreed to go to the Winter Formal with him, and he was not giving that up. As Ted and Takamoto continue to talk, Ted receives an alert. Ted excuses himself and is ready for action. The alert had come from the bug to tell him of another fire. Ted arrives on the scene and douses the flames and fire fists with foam before springing out himself. Sorry, fire fists, but the cookout's over. It appears we've run out of marshmallows. Really? Cause... Last time I saw this much foam on a building, we had just taken down a hundred foot marshmallow man. They begin to fight and eventually fall through the roof. Firefist has had it with Ted and brings down the roof on him. Gotta move fast. Leap to avoid that falling rubble before- No! It's everywhere! No way to save myself! No way to escape! Buddy. You're doing great. Really. Terrific. If I might offer a suggestion. Spend less time on the thinking narrate side of things, and more time on the getting the hell out of Dodge. It's going to benefit you, I promise you that. And our comic ends with the Blue Beetle caught under rubble as Firefist stands over him. Burn, Beetle, as soon this whole city shall burn. Burn! 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 Disco Inferno, burn, baby, burn. Anyway. That was Blue Beetle number one from 1986. I enjoyed it. Is this review a little biased? Probably, but I'm sure the same argument can be made for all my reviews. The story is nothing special and is bogged down by paragraph over paragraph of exposition. That being said, when it does get to its point, it is very good and establishes character relationships for the series. The art is good, not great, but good. You can tell what our characters are emoting, and some of the action sequences are pretty fun. All in all, maybe not the best read, but a fun read, and a great lead into one of comics' most underappreciated heroes. Check it out if you can. As always, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. This is The Watcher of New Earth, signing off.